American 11, are you trying to call? The cop is not answering their phones. Our number one has been stabbed, and our five has been stabbed. Hey, I'm going to call from Washington. I am in a situation with American 11, a possible hijack. What's going on, Betty? The crap is erratic again. Problem, um, very erratic. Now, one of our producers said perhaps a second plane was involved. In okay, hold on. The, the people here are, everybody's panicking. All right, well, the that building's exploding right now. You got people running up the street. Okay. I don't know what I'm telling you what's going on. Uh, am the I still connected? The crash of these two aircraft into the towers of the World Trade Center in New York appear to be an act of terrorism. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. Yes, a good evening, everybody. Very warm welcome to the Bali tonight and also the people looking, watching this evening from home. Um, my name is Jure Albrecht, I'm the director of the Bali and I will be conducting this conversation. It's a real, real, real pleasure to be conducting this conversation with Mohamed Ultslai, who spent 14 years in Guantanamo Bay without being convicted, and with Nancy Hollander, the lawyer who got Mohamed Ultslai out. We'll be talking to two real-life heroes, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Nancy Hollander is an internationally renowned criminal defense lawyer from the United States, New York and Albuquerque. Practiced criminal law and focused on civil rights cases and was named as one of the United States' best 50 litigators. One of her clients was WikiLeaks whistleblower Chelsea Manning. She represented two detainees from Guantanamo Bay, among whom Mohamedou Oudslai was one of them, of course. And uh, in the feature film, The Mauritanian, uh, it was based on old who was based on Old Sly's um, Guantanamo Diary, which I really, really recommend you to read. It's just an amazing, amazing book. But the book was the basis for uh, the film, The Mauritanian, and uh, Jodie Foster played the role of Nancy Hollander. Um, Mohamed Old Sly trained as an engineer in Germany and was arrested in his home country in Mauritania in 2001. And after a year, he was taken to Guantanamo Bay prison, where he was held for 14 years and severely tortured. No charges were ever brought against him. And in 2015, he was still incarcerated. And the book was published then. He was still in custody. 2016, he was released. And this year, he is artist and writer in residence here at the Bali, which is a great honor. Mohamedou, um, just to start with, and we will come later on why we showed this first pictures, but if you look at those pictures now, what, what are the thoughts you, you have looking at destruction of the Twin Towers? Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, I would like to thank you uh, very much. And I'm really very overwhelmed with uh, gratitude and happiness that uh, my sister and my lawyer Nancy is here. I remember the first thing I asked you, I told you I needed to get Nancy here. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember that. And, I know. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, if there is any hero, it's Nancy who uh, 
who get, got me out of prison, and you who got me with your uh, colleague and associate who got me from uh, being under house arrest to uh, not house arrest, but I couldn't leave the country, and you got me to uh, uh, this beautiful country, the Netherlands. And I also, speaking of people who supported me, I would like to give a very big shout out to my sister and my colleague, Raja, who is also my colleague here at the Bali. She couldn't come today. She said to give uh, you her love. And uh, she's a little bit sick. She couldn't come, but she's watching us. If you watch us, hi. <laughs> so uh, those photos, I really, those like image, I try to avoid watching them because they really awaken so much pain and in, on many levels. So much pain for those who lost their life senselessly. You know, and they were not expecting anyone to kill them. And also they remind me of uh, a couple of weeks after this happened that I also lost, lost my mom, never to see her again. It's a history of loss. And, uh, and it's very saddening, that's all I want to say. Um, you're a New Yorker. If you see these images, what go through your head? I do remember that day. I was in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the first, at first I had no idea what was happening. Um, someone said, called me and said, turn on your TV. And I turned it on just as the second plane went into the second tower. And I still didn't know what was happening. And I went to my office, and nobody did any work. We just watched TV all day. And it reminded me of the Cuban Missile Crisis when mm -hmm. I was in college, when nobody did anything because we thought the world was going to blow up. And um, the second thing I did was try to reach my family uh, and my friends in New York. Uh, and I couldn't, I couldn't reach them. Nobody could reach them. I actually saw one on television, on CNN. I saw a friend of mine standing um, full of soot. And I thought, well, I can check him off. At least he's alive. Um, but um, you know, now when I think of it, and I see President Bush there saying, we're going to get them, and yet they let all the Saudis fly home. Um, and we're best friends with Saudi Arabia, and I have nothing against the Saudi people, but the government, you know, we now know that it was complicit. Um, and I watched Bush say uh, things that he didn't really mean or didn't really know, but it, it's just so different now. And when I think of the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans who died as a result of 9-11. Um, that's really what I think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you already sense then, because it severely changed America, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah? and, and did you already sense at the moment that, because you said it reminded me of the Cuba crisis, or did you, that it would change America? I didn't know that it would change America. No. Um, I just knew that it was um, something immense was happening, and I didn't know what it was. It was also the day that Kennedy was killed. We didn't know whether that was the beginning of a coup, uh, what was going to happen next. Um, and it, it was frightening at the time. No, no, no. Um, I'm also showing these images to get us back into what um, you two were up to after that. Um, how it, of course, it sort of severely changed America and suddenly people were arrested because we will hold these people responsible. That's what George Bush is saying. And he, and he did, you know, unlawfully often, but he did. <laughs> and, um, some, he held some people responsible, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because, um, we're going to ask Jochem ten Haaf, a famous actor, to read out a short passage. Because um, in 2002, 
you were arrested, and um, well, well, let's listen to the passage first and then talk about it. A person was undoing the chains on my wrists. He undid the first hand, and another guy grabbed that hand and bent it, while a third person was putting on the new, firmer and heavier shackles. Now my hands were shackled in front of me. Somebody started to rip my clothes with something like a scissors. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I started to worry about the trip I neither wanted nor initiated. Somebody else was deciding everything for me. I had all the worries in the world but making a decision. Many thoughts went quickly through my head. The optimistic ones suggested, maybe you're in the hands of Americans, but don't worry. They just want to take you home and to make sure that everything goes in secrecy. The pessimistic ones went, you screwed up. The Americans managed to pin some shit on you and they're taking you to US prisons for the rest of your life. I was stripped naked. It was humiliating, but the blindfold helped me miss the nasty look of my naked body. And during the whole procedure, the only prayer I could remember was the crisis prayer. Ya hayu, ya kayum. And I was mumbling it all the time. Whenever I came to be in a similar situation, I would forget all my prayers except the crisis prayer, which I learned from life of our prophet, peace be upon him. One of the team members wrapped a diaper around my private parts. Only then I was dead sure that the plane was heading to the United States. Now I started to convince myself that everything is going to be all right. My only worry then was about my family seeing me on TV in such a degrading situation. I was so skinny. I've always been skinny, but never that skinny. My street clothes had become so loose that I looked like a, a small cat in a big bag. When the US team finished putting me in the clothes they tailored for me, a guy removed the blindfold for a moment. I couldn't see much because he directed the flashlight into my eyes. And he was wrapped from hair to toe in a black uniform. He opened his mouth and stuck his tongue out, gesturing for me to do the same, a kind of AHH test, which I took without resistance. I saw part of his very pale, blonde-haired arm, which cemented my theory of being in Uncle Sam's hands. Thank you, Jochen ten Haaf. Um, we'll be, you'll be back later on this evening. Um, when did you realize, Mohammed? these are your own words, so you wrote this in Guantanamo Bay almost 15 years later, but um, when did you realize for the first time that they really thought that you were responsible for 9-11? Can you remember that? <clears throat> you know, there is uh, an Arab uh, proverb, the last thing that dies is hope. Mm -hmm. And we always try to keep hope. And uh, at every step, I thought this is a very big mistake. This is just, just made a mistake, mm -hmm. but you know, and I always try to believe that the people I'm with are good people. It's just, they are well-intentioned. They mean well, so. And because the other option is really very devastating to me, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, at every step, even when, the, when I entered the torture program, like, I was in a situation like twilight. I, I couldn't tell the difference between uh, sleep and wakefulness. And I, 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 I don't feel pain anymore. They and kept you awake for? Uh, 70 days. 70 days. Yeah. The first 70 days. They didn't yeah. stop, but 
the first 70 days no sleep. And this is also why Nancy always said that torture doesn't work. And because when you reach a level, you don't feel anything anymore. You know, there is no feeling. And you just like, I was numb all the time, mm -hmm. very completely numb. And I remember I told Nancy and she was crying and I was like, hey, hey. I didn't tell you this to cry. <laughs> I just mm -hmm. tell you my story. And, uh, and I always wanted, I always wanted to believe this is a very big mix up. But Nancy was very cynical. And, yeah, and she was right and I was wrong. Completely, I was completely wrong. Because I thought they want the truth, but they don't want the truth at all. This is not because I'm a Muslim or I'm a person of color, which doesn't help actually. But in America too, the justice system is very vindictive, especially against people of color or other minority, and uh, it's the way it works. You're saying, you're saying, I wanted to keep believing it was surrounded by good people. Um, that's, that's, very, that's very nice and very impressive, but um, it's, it's, how to put this? I mean, people are torturing you and you kept it, was that a decision, or is that just a way to survive it, which you did? But, or is that too simple? Is it nothing to do with a decision? Or, it's hard to, it's hard to understand in a way, because I mean the scene we just been read out, wonderfully read out. You wrote, it's just you know it's a, there are much worse pages in the book. So. Yeah, you said it. I think it's a way to survive. Because if you believe people are bad, people are out there to get me, you're really very screwed. Because I, I'm so, I, so there is one thing. So you have to understand, like, I know you are a writer, and you want to uh, download my head now. But I can tell you how I thought about it. So. In, in the cell, in the cell in Guantanamo Bay, I felt safe. Why? Because I lived in terror and fear when I was wanted. Because they can come every day. Now they have me, okay. Alhamdulillah, thank God, now they have me. They will not capture me anymore. And then when they tortured me, I said, oh, thank God, they tortured me. I, I, I'm not afraid anymore of torture. Because we have another thing in Arabic, Waiting on torture is worse than torture. And then I said, okay. And I really, you know, I'm trying to explain to you someone who is not in his right state of mind. And you cannot explain that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you believe Muhammadu? If he says these amazing things? I do believe him. I, I, I have no idea what he felt when he felt it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when I first heard about his torture from him, um, it was hard for me to believe. It was hard for me to believe that he'd been tortured the way he said. This was before I knew what the government was doing mm -hmm. um, to people in Guantanamo, before I knew what Donald Rumsfeld had written, before any of that, and it was like, do you think this really happened to him? Is, is he exaggerating? Um, and then I slowly learned from the government documents mm -hmm. that everything he said was true. And you were surprised in a way. I was that, surprised in yeah. a way. Yeah. I was relieved that my client was telling me the truth. I've had mm -hmm. a lot of clients who don't always tell you the truth. You know, mm -hmm. they tell you kind of what they think you want to hear, and it takes time for someone to trust you enough to tell you the truth. But Muhammadu trusted us from the beginning. And so he told us everything at the beginning. And that was new for me. Um, and it was so horrific that 
it was hard to believe that he was sitting there just kind of matter-of-factly telling us about it. Mm -hmm. um, you once said that you have been fighting the state for most of your life, um, which, is, um, uh, which is true, actually, if you look at your, your record, the people you defended. And, um, was it a logical step for you to defend somebody who was accused of being involved in 9-11, or was it difficult, or was it... Well, was it, let me go back a little bit. When I said I've been fighting the government my whole life, I meant starting when I was 17 years old and sat down to demonstrate against the lack of a fair housing um, uh, program in Ann Arbor, Michigan when I was a freshman in college. Mm -hmm. And then I got arrested, I got arrested, and I got arrested in a fight with Mayor Daley. I mean, not a physical fight, but a, a, a basically a fight. The cops wouldn't let me in, and I knew I had a seat in this place, and we had a, a bickered, and I ended up arrested, and then I got arrested a third time um, in New York, um, demonstrating against um, Chase Manhattan Bank's involvement in the apartheid government in South Africa. So when I say I was fighting the government, I meant that. And the way I've usually said that is I've been fighting the government my whole adult life, and now I sometimes get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get paid for Mohamedou. Um, but yes. Are you asking Yuri now to pay? What? <laughs> yeah, now you can pay me. Anytime. <laughs> we'll remember that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. Um, I'll make a note. <laughs> <laughs> make a note. Mohamedou owes Nancy. Right. No, he doesn't owe me anything. But um, it was logical. You know, I had represented um, the Holy Land Foundation which was the largest Muslim charity in America, and that was a big fight. I uh, worked on a team representing someone named Wen Ho Lee, charged with espionage back in 1999. Um, I had you know, been involved in some other cases like that, and when it came up um, that people were in Guantanamo and needed lawyers, it, it was the natural thing to do. Because at that point, you didn't know whether it was Rightly accused, wrongly accused? I didn't know anything no. about him. No. I didn't know anything about him or the case, uh, what case it was exactly. Um, all I knew was uh, there was this guy in, in uh, Guantanamo. His mother had contacted a lawyer in Mauritania. That lawyer had contacted a lawyer in Paris, and he had contacted me, and I decided to go do it. No. Yeah. And partly, I reckon, I don't know, but I'm, I'm wondering, partly probably because it's so unlawful what happened in Guantanamo Bay that well, it, sort of made you angry. It, well, of course it made me angry. I mean, at that time, the government said there'll be no confidentiality. I mean, at, at first I had to decide whether I was willing to risk my bar card being a lawyer because you're not supposed to represent someone if you can't ensure them confidentiality. And I didn't know if I could. So that was taking a leap, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a big leap that we all took at that time. Yeah, yeah. And, um, well, you just mentioned that that was before, uh, then, then you met Mohamedou. You, you did. I read somewhere that you described how he opened his arms the first time um, when you entered uh, Guantanamo prison. Um, were you surprised that a small woman from Albuquerque <laughs> was there to represent you? or what? Or yes, absolutely. I was pleasantly surprised. And I remember I sat on a table that looks like this. And this is about the same distance, I think, correct? And then, uh, just like you saw in the movie, so I sat like this, and I was like, smiling, you know, like. I never met any person like this was. Uh, four years, four years, I never, I never met a civilian in my life. 
Only the prison guards and the prison guard the, or the military. Yeah. Or like yeah. military or paramilitary people. And this is the first time I meet a real person. And uh, I was just happy to meet a person. I didn't care, <laughs> you know. And then I said, I was very happy. I went, shaved everything, and I put my uniform, prison uniform. You know, it's, you know, Germans say, Die Qual der Wahl. I didn't have Die Qual der Wahl. <laughs> the torture of too many choices. I had only uniform. I said to the guard, should I take this uniform or this uniform? This looks good on you. <laughs> Took it, put it on. And then I sat just like this. And she opened the door. And then they made me like look at the door, the guards, because for security reasons. And then I stood like this. And then I want to say hi. And then th this is all I could reach. And then she, she said, she was like, she was startled. And then. And then she came, she realized that I was shackled to the ground. To the ground. I couldn't move. That's why when you see the footage, uh, Guantanamo always like walk in a funny way because we bent. That's a system to make us always do like this in order to control us, you know? And uh, yeah, that was the first meeting. And I was so happy and I prepared note. I gave her, I think, 163 pages I wrote. And then he, he put out his arms, and when we realized, I was with the other lawyer, Sylvia, yeah. we realized that um, he couldn't move and that he was trying to hug us. We walked into his arms, and he hugged us and said, my lawyers. <laughs> you know, we were the first friendly people he'd seen in four years. Four years, yeah. And then he talked to you, and he, he described what... Um, he gave us that book, um, but we people assume that he gave us the book and we got to go back to um, our hotel room, such as it was in Guantanamo, and read it. Well, we didn't because they took it from us and put it in an envelope and we sealed it up and it went up to Virginia to a secure room. And I didn't actually get to read it for a month or two later. So we just had to rely on what he was telling us. And we were afraid, as I recall, to take notes that were too detailed, because we didn't really trust that that was going to get to where it went without being opened. Was it opened? No. Mm. So as later. far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Unless they steamed it open. Yeah. And uh, let's have a look, because you mentioned this was before you actually understood so the depth of the deprivation Guantanamo actually went, uh, put people through. Um, let's have a little look at um, Donald Rumsfeld and um, uh, the way sort of he uh, formulates what's right and wrong. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, <laughs> excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just wondering I'm not this going, is an unknown. I'm not going to say which it is. We'll, we'll have a look at the, the, that fragment afterwards. Um, this, I mean, this is about um, uh, um, Iraq, of course, and the weapons of mass destruction, and Iraq allegedly had. But um, it's also about the way he thinks, mm -hmm. and. Um, Donald Rumsfeld personally signed off on the orders for torture. Yes, he did, for Mohamedou and for another man named al Qatani, yeah. And they were the worst tortured in Guantanamo. And it was based on what he wrote specifically. It was his, the Rumsfeld program for torture. Some of it they couldn't do. Uh, one thing, for example, he wanted them to put Mohamedou in an airplane and fly it around and pretend that they were gonna push him out. 
um, which is something that was done actually during the Vietnam War. And they couldn't, they couldn't do it because too many people would know what mm -hmm. they were doing. So they scratched that one. Mm -hmm. um, but everything else that he wanted them to do, they did. But as a lawyer, um, can you explain to me how on earth that's possible that the minister actually signs in a country which is ruled by rule of law and a democracy, that, I mean, and that he's not in prison? Well, I mean, how, how does that work? If I were in charge, he might have been in prison, but, uh, or at least prosecuted. I don't really believe anyone should go to prison, but prosecuted. But that's neither here nor there. There was nothing about the rule of law in Guantanamo. No. Nothing. They didn't intend it to be anything to do with the rule of law. They believed Rumsfeld, Cheney, uh, Gonzalez, and they convinced Bush, because I don't ever think Bush had a real idea of his own ever in his mind, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they, they, they said, look, we'll put these people there. They'll never have lawyers. They're not subject by, to American law because after all, this is Cuba, and um, we don't have to worry about it. And of course, that turned out not to be true, the United States Supreme Court said, yes, you do have to worry about it, and they can file writs of habeas corpus, but those, that came years later. But they really believed that they could do whatever they wanted. Gonzalez, who was the attorney general at the time, famously said, um, the Geneva Convention is a quaint, quaint treaty, and we don't have to abide by it. He called it quaint. Yeah little sort of fringe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, did you, Mohamedou, did you know about Donald Rumsfeld when you were in Guantanamo Bay, or did you learn, did you, was you aware of sort of American ministers or presidents, or is that just, is that after you left Guantanamo Bay that you became aware of the... So, uh, when I was kidnapped from home in Ramadan 2001. In Mauritania. In Mauritania. It was the last time I saw my family. I vividly remember seeing my mom with prayer beads, like frantically like this, and then she disappeared. So I was cut off from the rest of the world. I was not allowed to know anything. And uh, when Nancy, comes to me, I try to interrogate her, to be tricky, ask her about the news, but she never, she always tell me, I cannot tell you, you know, <laughs> and we laugh about it. So Nancy lived with me through that when I was not allowed to know anything. So of course, I don't know anything about this, and this all happened. I was not briefed about it, so obviously. And, uh, no information. It's all like hit me without knowing anything. Later on, you decided to sue him recently. Uh, him? Rumsfeld. Uh, like the habeas corpus, I think it's suing the government. Yeah. And he is part of the government, I think. You, you wrote his name as. Uh, well, we didn't. At some point, I think him, uh, George W. Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, and then you changed to Barack Obama and uh, right. the other guy. Right. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> the other guy? Yeah, it's. Uh, the other guy. The vice right. president, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, then that, those were, the, that was the habeas. And I petition. remember this, is now I remember. I wrote you a letter, I said, I don't want to uh, sue Obama. Because I heard that he's a good guy. And then, you remember that you told me, no, this is, we have to sue him because he's the one who is holding you here. You remember that discussion we had? I, I don't, but I, it sounds like yeah. something you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I will not sue a Muslim guy. <laughs> and the guard told me he was a Muslim. <laughs> but he's responsible for you being in jail another seven yes. years. Yes. 
Yeah, you explained to me that you have to sue him in person. Let's have a look at a few, uh, 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 a few minutes from the Mauritanian, from the movie, and talk a little bit more about habeas corpus. We could talk about many things, you know, watching this scene, but... Um, it's not really a suit. I mean, it, it's really, you, you put their names on it because they are the people responsible for where he was imprisoned. It's, yeah. the, it's whoever's holding him, and he is against those, those people, whoever. It's often the, the prison warden in some other place, but these were the people holding him. So these were the people we were saying to the, to the court, these are the people who shouldn't be holding him, they're holding him illegally. And these are the people, that's the American government who's that's holding right. him. That's right. Yeah. Because um, to explain the legal situation, he was held illegally and against his will, obviously, and um, there were no accusations, at least you could see. Or be, so, so how did you get him out legally if there's if it's if it's meant to be outside if it's if it's especially made that prison you know to be not in the jurisdiction of the united states that's why it was on the cuban coast in a military base so it was all set up not to have a lawyer getting right. prisoners out so how how did that work i mean it took well, years the, and years but but the legally. first the first well the first few years um they wrote Prisoners wrote habeas corpus petitions, and the government took the position, well, they can write them, but there's no remedy. And the Supreme Court said, no, they get to have lawyers. And the Bumidian case in 2008 said they get to have lawyers and, well, they first had been told they got to have lawyers, but that case said to the government, you've got to respond to this habeas. You've got to respond. And so that's when we first got the government's response. Mm -hmm. And the government sent us this big, thick response with all kinds of allegations in it. And you know, we looked at it it's like, OK, we're going to have to tackle these one at a time. So there were so many things in there, none of which they could ever prove, none of which they did ever prove. But we had a hearing in 2009 in front of Judge Robertson. And Mohamedou testified, and uh, Judge Robertson ruled but that he, he he couldn't come over. But was in he no he couldn't come over. He was on video. Yeah, um, the government didn't put on any evidence. They just uh, questioned Mohamedou in ways that were pretty silly. Uh, you said this, didn't you? Yes, and you said this, didn't you? Yes, and the the judge finally said, Yeah, we know what he said you know, go somewhere else, do something else. And they didn't really have anything except to say, you said this, you said this, you said this. And so that's all yes, they did. Yes, he was tortured as yes, well. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> well, they weren't, they, they said they weren't using any of the evidence from when he was tortured, but um, that's what they claimed. But they didn't have anything else. They just didn't have anything at all. We put on Mohamedou, we put on a psychiatrist or psychologist, I think was he? No, he's a psychiatrist. Um, Yacapino? Yacapino. Yeah, and, um, you know, we, we put on, we were very methodical about what we put on. And the judge ruled that the government had not proved that. Mohamedou, oh, they, they hadn't proved that they had enough evidence to hold him. And it's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. All they had to prove was just what we call a preponderance of evidence. Just it has to be, just tip the edge, more likely than not, that um, the government had legitimate authority to hold him. And the judge said they'd, they had eight years. They didn't, they didn't prove anything. So we won. And we were all very excited, and we, Mohamedou thought he was going to get out. And then the government immediately appealed. And the reason I say that President Obama is responsible for the next seven years is that they didn't have to appeal those cases. That was during Obama's Justice Department that appealed every single one that was one below, except for maybe one or two juveniles that they let go. They, they didn't need to appeal those. 
they could just let those people go home. So it was contrary to what Obama had said when he said, I want to close Guantanamo. Well, if you want to close Guantanamo, let the people out where the judges have ruled that the government doesn't have evidence to hold them. And Mohamedou's case went up, and the Court of Appeals, uh, the legal term is remanded it. They sent it back to the uh, district court and said that he had to find some more specific things and do things differently. And he never ruled again. So nothing happened until finally, toward the end of his term, Obama set up something called the Periodic Review Board. He had set it up earlier, but he didn't really fund it, and it didn't get going till toward the end. Of his term, of his second of term. Of his second yeah. term. Yeah. And that was a group of uh, five or six intelligence agencies. We never were told which ones. And they met in a secret place. We couldn't see them. Um, and they interviewed Mohamedou. He was entitled to have counsel but counsel could only be with him for a short period of time. He had somebody who was a personal representative who could represent him, and he had this wonderful guy um, who was an engineer, but who really believed in Mohamedou and really was... Jackson. Yes, Reggie Jackson, really believed in him, um, who helped him through that. And it didn't take them any time at all to find what they were looking for, which is he is not a significant threat to the U.S. or its allies. That's all they were supposed to look at, not what the, what the alleged crime was. And since Mohammed had never been charged with anything, there was no crime to look at, but what he had even been accused of. Although they had it in front of them, because I saw it. But, so they did kind of look at it, but it just didn't take them any time at all. And then we had to decide where he was going to go. And that took another couple of months of meeting with the Department of State and negotiating. And then when they finally said he could go to Mauritania, they said we couldn't tell anyone. And that if anyone found out and put it up on social media, he wouldn't leave. And Mohamedou's family loves social media. And Mohamedou would talk to them on um, through the International Red Cross. And I kept saying to Mohamedou, don't say anything, not a word about this. And then, I mean, all the way till the end, and they said, we want you to be on the ground when he gets there to support him. I said, okay, then I have to know when he's leaving. Well, we're not gonna tell you when he's leaving, but <laughs> I have to know when he's leaving to be there. Well, we can't tell you that. But finally, we figured out when he was going to leave, more or less. And then when he didn't leave on the Sunday, we figured it had to be the Monday. And I flew from Albuquerque to New York to Paris to Mauritania. He flew straight across. Because if you look at a map, Guantanamo is straight across on the same latitude as Mauritania. So he got there maybe a day before I did. And then I got there, and then Terry got there the next day. Um, and we saw him as a free person for the first time. So the judge ordered Mohamedou to be released in 2010, and it took Two th the yes. whole he term of Obama, basically <laughs> six years more, right. to do that. Right. And he, that's right. And fortunately, we got him out just before Trump came in. There was someone, because once they made their decision, then um, Congress had 25 days in which to review it. And there was another man whose decision was at the same time, and he didn't quite get through Congress in time. So he didn't get out. He He's just, still there. He got out this year. This year? This year. This year. Omar, his name is Omar. Yeah. Omar. Yeah, I know him. He was with me in Lima Block. And he just got out. Yes. And one, another Moroccan, Abdul Latif, uh, the guy who was supposed to sign fell asleep. No, he came late to the office. And his file stayed there for four more 
year, five years. Right. Yes, it's very saddening. There are still 36 prisoners in Guantanamo Bay now? There are 36, I believe. 20 have been cleared for release and are not, are still there. One person was cleared for release in 2009. But that's the other thing that Obama did. There was a, um, an attempt to blow up an airplane over Detroit at some point during Obama's uh, term. And the, they caught the guy, and he was Nigerian. And he was trained, he is Nigerian, he was trained by someone in Yemen. And so President Obama said, none of the Yemenis can go home, because we don't know if they're going to become terrorists again, or become terrorists for the first time, because now they hate us, um, because they've been here. And most of the people, a good number of the people who are still there are Yemens, Yemenis. And now they don't have a home to go to. Um. If a country sort of plays with the rule of law and the sort of blatant way you found out and you, um, you fought, um, would you still consider your country a democracy? Well, it's an interesting question. <laughs> Whether I've thought the United States was ever a democracy. Okay. It's been a democracy for some people, mm -hmm. but never for everyone. You know, it was founded by um, genocide of the Native Americans. It was never democracy for them. They didn't even get the citizenship until 1924. Some of them didn't get the right to vote in their own country until 1968. Mm -hmm. So it's never been a democracy for them. Um, slaves, it was, it was founded with, by slavery even before. Uh, it was never a democracy for them. Is it now? Query for some. Um, and then every minority, every group that ever came to the United States, Italians, Irish, um, any number of uh, Muslims, um, how many more should I name? Um, it was never a democracy for them uh, most of the time. So is it a democracy? Now one could say it's a democracy for some people. I would never say it's ever been a democracy for everyone. I would never say that the rule of law has ever applied to everyone, because it hasn't, and it still doesn't. But strangely enough, um, I, I understand very well what you're saying, of course, but strangely enough, you're a lawyer, and through the courts, and paradoxically enough, you finally did get Muhammad out. Right. It wasn't through a court, though. It was through um, a, a procedure. It wasn't a court. It was a procedure mm -hmm. um, of the six intelligence agencies meeting. Yeah. So that did get him out, finally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but would you say that it was a country based on the rule of law when he was held for 15 years without ever being charged um, and tortured? and the people who were tortured in the black sites, um, who are in Guantanamo now, and have been there since 2006, and have never gone to trial. You know, it, it's, it's hard to say that that's a country based on the rule of law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really hard to say. Yeah. How do you look upon that, on America being democracy or a place I'm not going home. back to Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though, for the opportunity. <laughs> I'm sticking around here. <laughs> uh, and with a little luck, I'll still get back into the U.S. when I fly tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, you know, you know, I, I really hate, like, to ignore the big elephant in the room, you know. Uh, because Guantanamo Bay was about revenge and collective punishment. And collective punishment is one of the tools of the uh, occupier and of the uh, colonizer. Americans 
European who came to America, they did it to the Indians. They would tell the Indian, if anyone does anything in the village, we will wipe the village out. And they did it in, in uh, New England. So, and uh, when the German came in the Second World War, the people who were resisting German were terrorists. They were called terrorists. And uh, they, uh, I, I forget the name of the Dorpsche, a very small village. Put it. I yeah, think. put yeah. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're yeah, right. So, mm -hmm. one of them attacked, just resisted against the, uh, the 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 German occupier, and no one would tell who that person was. And they came and they executed many people in the. I don't know whether they did everyone, but a lot of innocent people, just to show them an example that terrorism will not be accepted. You know, and they do it in Israel. No one can resist the occupation and so on and so forth. So terrorism does not, the crime of terrorism does not belong in a democracy. And I'm telling you, when I was in Guantanamo Bay, I hated the news when we were allowed because I was shaken because if a brown guy does something bad, I'm responsible. So I have, and anyone in here can tell you that, uh, even back in the 90s when someone who claims they're Muslim does something wrong, we all pay for it, every single Muslim or brown person for that. Even Indian who are not Muslim, they attack them, you know? And this is something we need to discuss because the crime of terrorism does not belong in a democracy. It's a political thing. And we, like Nancy said, Richard Zuli is the leader of my team. I remember him, you know. You know, the kind of people who, who never listen to you, you know, that just, ah, then they always talk. And then I was like listening to him and he told me he was going to kidnap my mother. And I know he had the power to do that. This is so saddening that, like you said, in a democracy that a person has this much power to kidnap people who are innocent, you know, using the tool of the most powerful country on earth the United States of America. And I just lost it. I was, I was begging him, I said, I would do anything you want. I, I told this story about what I want to tell you to connect with the point of Nancy. He was also responsible for the torture of black people in, uh, in uh, what? Chicago. Chicago. And he put black people, innocent black people, behind bar for 20, 30 years. After 20, 30 years, they found out they're completely innocent because he tortured them. So they did not see the rule of law inside the United States of America. And, uh, and we know that democracy is a process. I am, as an Arab person, a Muslim person, I have no right to criticize the Netherlands or the United States of America because we are really doing bad in our countries. And I'm not going here to pretend that we are you know, anything but horrific regimes. And we need to change and we need to learn from you because the Netherlands also <coughs> history was not exactly a democracy. Ah, 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 ah. You know, <laughs> and it's a process and we all are responsible, you know, to maintain the process because I don't have weapon. I don't have the police. I only have the law. If the law fails, Nancy and I can do nothing because democracy is premised on the uh, cooperation between the judiciary, uh, the uh, executive branch, and the, uh, the, 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 the legislative. In America, the, 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 the executive branch completely disrespected both the legislative and the, uh, uh, and the judiciary. And Again, I, I want to say something here, you know, for, for the especially people of minority here. You know, in my cross-examination, you remember this. He was telling me, did you watch jihadi <coughs> movies? I said, yes. <coughs> uh, uh, do you uh, believe in jihad? I said, yes. And then he said, so did you see like violent movies? I said, yes. And then the judge, uh, Nancy, when you remember, he said, 
what are you asking? What kind of a question is that? And then Nancy said, I think you gave an example of American film. What was the film? The, the violence, you know, feel about violence and so, and they agreed with you. So, so anyway, so, I mean, we are not allowed to be different. I am a teenager and I watch everything that is stupid and I'm not apologizing for it and I don't need to apologize for it. And this is, you know, uh, the judge saw this, said, what does that have to do with anything? And he told him, go for the jugular. The first time I heard this expression, I never forget it. Uh, he said, go for the jugular. But you ain't got no jugular. And then uh, he said, no, I don't. He said, that's what I thought. And then he completely stopped. And he was like, he's denying everything. And he couldn't do anything. I said, I told him, I didn't do anything. What should I say? So democracy is good for everyone. It's really good for everyone. And we're all responsible for it. It's not the responsibility of government. Nancy defended democracy. Yuri, with his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, work of freedom of speech, is defending and promoting democracy everywhere. Khutbe is <laughs> done. <laughs> Let's Actually, what the judge said that you've forgotten is the judge said, um, and excuse the cough, I'm sorry. Don't the, worry. the judge said, um, Fortune, something of fortune. No, he said, he said to the government, um, are you assuming that jihad means terrorism? And they said yes. And he said, no. No, that's not what it means. And then he yeah, said, and then he said <clears throat> go for the jugular. Yes, and it was, um, I think the reference you're making is to Charlie Wilson's war. Yes, that, right. Yeah. Because that was the other one. Um, the government said, well, you joined Al Qaeda, didn't you? And Mohammedu said, yes, but just like it says in the movie, same side. He says, yes, but you were supporting it too. And um, I said something about, uh, Your Honor, um, we were supporting Al Qaeda and bin Laden at that time, and the judge said, "Yes, Miss Hollander, we've all seen Charlie yes. Wilson's war, yeah. Yeah. right?" <laughs> Which, if you haven't seen it, is about the Americans giving Stinger missiles to the Pakistanis, who then gave them to the Afghans, who used them to shoot down the Soviet planes. Um, there's. Other things we could talk about um, with that scene in mind we just saw, but I mean, you asked a prisoner in Guantanamo Bay who was having no rights, not even, he was nowhere legally to sue the president? Well, <laughs> I mean, I the, mean, I didn't. He really. was in an isolation cell for most right, for years no, and years. I, I, I asked him, um, he'd already filed the petition for the writ of habeas corpus. So at that point in the movie, it's not entirely accurate. But I did ask him if we could file a petition uh, to to get the freedom of info under the Freedom of Information Act, and it was that way that we because we were getting nothing from the government, and that was essentially what that lawsuit was. It was requesting that we get. Uh, information that was supposedly public. And sure enough, we got his medical records. Now, people later in Guantanamo weren't able to get them. Uh, they said they were classified. I've never heard of people's own medical records being classified. That's a mystery. But we got Mohamedou's, and sure enough, it showed, was the first inkling I got, it showed that his ribs had been broken. It showed um, that... Um, he had sciatica and that 
this list of things they weren't supposed to do and that they did them all. You know, don't make his room too cold, don't make him stand in this position, et cetera, et cetera. It showed that he was supposed to get pain medication and they withheld it. And we got all of that from his medical records, which was the first and most important thing that we got from that lawsuit. Um, let's talk a little bit about the book, um, The Guantanamo Diary. Um, we talked with, um, last time we talked with Larry Seams, who edited the book while you were in prison. And um, Mohamedou, you wrote this on little pieces of paper who were, how small were the pieces of paper? Yes, I remember. So I started in my block, I remember. And uh, I was not allowed to have papers. But other detainees were, because they want to make war between detainees. So if you cooperate, we we'll give you papers. If you don't cooperate. And they said, I wasn't cooperating, even though I was. And then, uh, so as a good Muslim, I don't steal, but I borrow. <laughs> so <laughs> I. Uh, uh, so the detainee would, uh, would like, give me like paper through the, you know this, uh, the Chief. cage through the cage, yeah, through the cage, and then I take them and then I write very quickly. Then I didn't, I didn't know enough English to write, so I wrote in Arabic, uh, French, German. And then I wrote also in English what I hear them because I want to learn too. It was not meant to be anything except for me. And then uh, when they signed this, uh, torture program, they came to me and they took everything from me. Everything stripped me and then they put me in a cell in the block. And then I lost everything. And then I waited until they told me that Nancy and her colleague were coming. Uh, they told me now I can write and then they gave me paper. And then I started writing very quickly. And then I think I wrote 163 pages, something like that. And then in a very short time, and then I was so happy because I thought I'm going home, you know, because I saw law and order. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in law and order is true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's how I, and then Nancy told me, she, I don't know, I don't think she read everything, but she wrote me, keep writing, something like that. And then I just went and then I wrote everything in, I think, two or three months, I wrote everything. And then I, I used both sides of the paper, which angered her colleague, because I write here and then I write here. And Americans are easily, get angry very easily. <laughs> and then she told me, why do you write on both sides? And I was laughing, she said, why are you laughing? I said, I don't have papers. <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's 400, it's almost 400 pages. So you wrote it in very short time. 466 but, pages. Yeah, but that's, I think, with some sort of introduction. Uh, extra, she meant the yeah. handwriting. Yeah. Uh, the, right, handwriting. the handwriting, 466, yeah. Yeah. right. And, and um, how did, and because this says uh, the fully restored text. Um, restored? <laughs> yes, it is so, yeah, ask her. She knows. <laughs> because um, She's the only person in this room who knows exactly what they took away. Yeah, because, because, she, because, she the, can see it. because if you look at it in the book, there are um, these sort of patches where it is uh, blacked out and then it has been restored. And Larry Seams, uh, the editor, uh, told us uh, last time we were here um, uh, with Larry Seams, he told us that he, f he put in the blanks and afterwards checked it with you and you could remember almost anything, almost everything by heart and literally and with feel best it. guess, that's best guess. But she knows, ask uh, her. And exactly, so, so but, <laughs> but what are the, the black spots? The black spots were the things that the government decided were still classified. So if you read the first edition before yep. the restored edition, when it mm -hmm. first came out, those were all blacked out because they were classified. They still are classified. They still are, cl they still are classified? No, yes. they're not. I mean, you can read them. That doesn't mean they're not classified. <laughs> 
they're classified. I can't tell you whether those are true or false. I can't tell you whether he got it right but, because it's still classified. Because I'm the only one who's seen it in this classified version. In the sort of declassified version for a moment, sort of. A, a, you were the only one allowed to read them in full. I read the whole thing. Yeah. Right, and then it went... As, as, and then, as, as his lawyer. Uh, right, yeah. I read the whole thing. Yeah. And then when we decided to finally get it out because we litigated, right, we litigated this for years to try to get it released. Because you knew it was there. No, to try to get the, whole, the book released. Ah, out in the open. But yeah. mm -hmm. out in the open. But um, the government wouldn't do it. They claimed that we, um, you know, there could be codes in there. How did they know? Codes. Code words, you know. Right, okay. So you sure. never know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what could be in 40, 466 handwritten pages about torture. And <laughs> so finally we told Mohamedou he was going to have to give up the attorney-client privilege if we were going to get it out. Because don't forget, we wanted to get it out and just keep it as ours. So he did that. And we sent it to the government. They immediately made the whole thing an exhibit, classified exhibit in their pleadings. And then it took another several years, and finally it came back. And now it didn't say classified, but the whole thing said protected, every page. And that's a, that's a classification that they've made up. There's no such thing as protected. And what it really means is you can read it, we can fax it to you, you can sit down and read it in your office, but you can't ever show it to the press. Well, so that was not our deal with the government, so we went back and sent it back again, and then finally, two years later, it showed up with the 2,500 redactions, and that's the way it was published. Mohamedou and Larry did this version. I had nothing to do with it. With this version? Nothing to do with it. Because you're not allowed to. And I can't tell you today whether what they wrote in there is accurate. So if I ask you, was it David Hicks and Bisher L. Rell uh, on page 203, then you cannot comment. I cannot comment. Because it's ask still, him. <laughs> because it's still classified. Ask yeah. him. He always wants you to ask me because he wants to get me in trouble. But <laughs> <laughs> ask him. Mohamedou? I, I'm not bound by an own and I'm not going back to the US. So you can <laughs> ask me. So how did you fill in the blanks eventually? It's very hard because I wrote this in 2005. Yeah. And then it I disappeared for chance, years? Yeah, like many years, 12 years, more than 12 years. I had the chance to see it again. And uh, so there are things that are very certain, like Bishra Rawi, those are my friend. Bishra Rawi is British. And David Hicks is Australian. So I cannot forget them because they were my co detainees. And places. They and were the core detainees, the, the people who yes, they who were, were your with me sort of personal block. detainees. Yeah, they yeah. were detainees. Yeah, yeah, they were not interrogators. They were no. just like me, mm -hmm. and uh, places and dates, I cannot forget, never, to this day, and even time, I cannot forget time, because of the situation I was in, and uh, but the problem, the challenge, because they took very long portion. I cannot remember the long portion, you know. I have just to fill them with my best guess. And my best guess is that my best guess was not really very good. <laughs> and she knows, <laughs> like, <laughs> she can go every, she can go today and see it if she wants to. Because you still have the classified files. In yes, she has everything. Facility, yeah. Not in my office. No. But you can go and see it. And yes, check. I can. Yeah. But you American can't tell. privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see whether we can um, listen to a little more fragment of the book. 
because by now we know a little bit about you know, how it came about and how arduously people worked on it. So we ask Jochum ten Haaf to read out another passage. I was just wishing to pass out so I didn't have to suffer. And that was really the main reason for my hunger strike. I knew people like these don't get impressed by hunger strikes. Of course, they didn't want me to die, but they understand there are many steps before one actually does. You're not going to die. We're going to feed you up your ass, said Staff Sergeant Mary. I've never felt as violated in myself as I had since the DOD team started to torture me to get me to admit things I hadn't done. You, dear reader, dear listener, could never understand the extent of the physical and much more the psychological pain people in my situation suffered, no matter how hard you tried to put yourself in another person's shoes. Had I done what they had accused me of, I would have relieved myself on day one. But the problem is that you cannot just admit to something you haven't done. You need to deliver the details, which you can't when you haven't done anything. It's not just, yes, I did. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to make, make up a complete story that makes sense to the dumbest of dummies. And one of the hardest things to do is to tell an untruthful story and maintain it. And that is exactly where I was stuck. Of course, I didn't want to involve myself in devastating crimes I hadn't committed, especially under the present circumstances where the US government was jumping on every Muslim and trying to pin any crime on him. We are going to do this with you every single day, day in, day out unless you speak about Abdul Malak and admit to us your crimes, said Steph, Sergeant Mary. Thank you, Jochum Ten Haaf. Um, you, dear reader, could never understand the extent of the physical and much more the psychological pain people in my situation suffered, no matter how hard you try to put yourself in another one's shoes. You're right. Mahamadou. Um, that's, of course, very true. Um, I don't think, and you have witnessed this for decades, but I don't think we can really understand. But um, you travel the world trying to make us understand. I mean, you write this, but still, you, you, you're here. You, talk, you make movies, documentaries, feature movies. So what, what, what is it that, that you would try to convey with all your work after it? What are you hoping that we, we can understand or we should understand? Uh. You know, people in my region, like the Middle East and North Africa, uh, have been the exception to the rule for way too long. Like, it's very easy to vilify young people of color, you know. And the problem is, this is not an American problem, actually, or a European problem. This is, first and foremost, the problem of the regime that, by the way, are supported by the United States of America and its European allies. And the it's very... In the regime in, in... In my country, the regime who gave me, they mm -hmm. gave me based on the orders coming yeah. from the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And the job of my regime was to protect me, even if I, if, if I, if I had done what the US thought I had done, still my government her, the responsibility of my government is to protect me no matter what. That's actually what a country is about, to protect its citizen. And uh, so we are in this like uh, vicious cycle because people who are rich 
in the Netherlands and the US, they don't want poor people to come to them. They don't want them to bother them. So they support the dictator and the other the regime over there to keep them keep them over there. We don't want them. And uh, and like after the uh, last election in Mauritania three years ago, there were Salafis. People who don't understand Salafis, Salafis are like uh, Orthodox Muslims. So, and uh, so they made demonstration in Mauritania, and then they said they want Sharia law, and they are against the president. And a lot of like the intellectual people said those people belong in prison. And I came out. Actually, I can share with you the letter I wrote. I said, no, 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 no. They have the right to demonstrate, to do whatever they want to do. Because this is what going to bring like horrific stuff to us if we try to, uh, to, uh, uh, to stop people from expressing themselves. And I was so proud of the Netherlands in the, in the fever of the horrific crimes that, uh, that the ISIL did in Iraq, they made demonstration here in one of the city. And the only country in Europe that I know allowed them to uh, do the demonstration was in the Netherlands, ISIL people. And this is exactly what we need. You know, I am very extremist in freedom of speech. And we need to let people speak because when people talk, there is no violence. And I say all of this because I want my son to live the same freedom that you enjoy in your country. You know, I want people in Mauritania, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt. Is there an Egyptian here? I think Abdullah is here. OK, I report to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we want people. Do you know, Yuri, that people, Egyptian people, and uh, some people from other countries, they are they still in fear, even though like they are thousands of miles away from. This is the psychology of fear. And we need America to stop supporting like dictatorial regime. We need, because I know American people are beautiful people. I know they want democracy. I know they want human rights. And what their government do in supporting dictatorial regime does not represent decent American and most certainly does not represent my sister, Nancy. Um. You write in the book, and you've been telling us about how you can only be free when you forgive. And since you've been in prison for 15 years, um, can you explain that again to me? I mean, I don't think I would be able to forgive, um, knowing myself. So there is this. Uh, Australian nurse. What's her name? She wrote this, the, the biggest five regrets. What's her name again? Anyone knows her name? So she's Australian uh, nurse. And she was working with dying people. And she, she was curious. She asked them, what, what are your regrets in life? And they, and they came up with five biggest regrets. So, the, so one, I wish I had lived my life the way I wanted, not the way people wanted me to live. So, and two, I wish I had expressed myself. Uh, I think so. And three, I wish, uh, I wish I spent more time and gave more time to the people I love. And and one which which is uh, I think people who have companies wouldn't appreciate. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. <laughs> Yeah. This is my favorite, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know the other. So the point is this, that you would never know what matters in life before you see death. And I saw death not one time. I saw it many times. Not many, but at least three times. I remember, you know, you, I, I had no access to what you had access to, but I was the first death penalty case in Guantanamo. The first. They said, Muhammad al-Salah first need to die. And they were just you know, preparing. And Charlie came to me. And he's the one who broke the news to me. And he told me that I was chosen for death penalty, capital punishment. 
And then I, I was just like listening to him. And you would ask me what I felt. I had no feeling, I was numb. I was not afraid, but I was not not afraid either. I had no feeling. So someone is explaining to you the process of uh, how they, they are going to kill you. And how you he can was an interrogator. Right? Yes, he was an interrogator. Yes, he was working for uh, uh, Richard Zuli. And the problem, oppression. I knew their names, but they did not know that I knew their names. And I was playing with them, like because I was so subdued that I cannot say anything. And this is oppression because the oppressor does not know. The, the person they oppress because they are not allowing them to express themselves. So that a lot of dictators, they think really that people love them, but people don't love them, but people cannot say it, you know? So, and when they came, the, F, the CIA, when they took me from Jordan, I thought to myself, I would never see my family again. And then I regretted only one thing, not being kind to my family. I regretted every day I said bad thing to anyone. And I promised myself never, ever to say anything bad to anyone. And I know this is very hard to, you know, it's a very big, uh, very big, uh, you know, commitment. You know, and I'm not saying I'm perfect in it, but I really try to do it. I really try not to say anything bad and to be always kind and, and nice to everyone. I, when I walk to the street, I try to say, uh, I try to say, uh, 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 just like uh, greet people, everything, and talk to the dog, say, hello, uh, Ardikh, even though if the dog is not Ardikh. <laughs> and, and so, and kindness. So when you understand that this is my commitment, forgiveness is automatic. Because when you carry, like, hate, is really a very powerful weapon against yourself. You know, you have to free yourself from hate when you forgive people. It's not easy, but it's easier than carrying hate around. Hate is a very... <laughs> hate is a very powerful weapon against yourself? Yes. Yes. And so, would you say that, I always wonder how you, after the things you've lived through, how you wonder how you are so joyous and optimistic very often, is that, um, is that something which is for you a continuing process, something which you need to keep up, or is it something which has become sort of a way of living, or is it something you need to decide every day and keep up? You know, guys, this is, I wish I could explain to you what your freedom means, mm -hmm. but you have no access to understand what freedom means. No, I agree. You know, anyone went to prison here? Show of hands. There's one. Okay, you would understand. You know, in prison, in a cell, you cannot go pee. We, we go to the bathroom, where is the bathroom? That's it. You cannot go in prison if everything you do is watched. You have no privacy. Everything you say, is they hear it. And they have camera on you 24-7. I'm not even talking about torture. So, because I can only tell you, you can only know this is hot if you know uh, how it feels when, it, when it's uh, like cold. So, you can, we can only understand things when we compare them against other, you know, their um, opposite. And uh, you enjoy freedom, and I, I know, you know, you know, we have now the rise of fascism in Europe, you know. And I talk a lot of, with minorities, I work with refugees. I don't know why, but I work with the refugees. I decided, instead of being low profile, first day I start working with the refugees. I didn't learn anything. <laughs> so, and 
people talk about racism, in, in, even in this beautiful country. And I tell them I understand because there is always, there will be always xenophobia everywhere, but you have to understand the fact that you can talk about it and then you can express yourself. And Ashraf, we had this discussion when you came to me. And uh, that's what I try to tell the young people here, that they need to understand the value of their freedom. You know, that's, that's all I want, because this is really, I feel very passionate about it. Let's look at the last little scene from the movie about the same sort of topic, and then I have a few more questions, and maybe I go to, maybe some of you has, also has a question. This is your text, actually. The actor is doing a very good job. He's an amazing job he's doing. But um, yeah, it's your text. And, and Kevin thinks that is better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I respectfully disagree. <laughs> Kevin McDonald, we talked to him as well yeah, earlier this the year, time, the three yes. of us, yes, uh, the, the director of the movie. Um, uh, uh, he actually, I think, thought that he was more handsome, wasn't it? And Jochem, Jochem ten Haaf said, no, it's ah, not I didn't not hear that all. part. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I would disagree with uh, Kevin McDonald. But um, um, this is your text. Um, so forgiving and forgiveness and freedom is the same thing? That was original idea from me. Uh, with the verb of Afa. Uh, uh, mean uh, free and mean also means also uh, to forgive. And I mean people, you know, I don't know how to explain this, but you really feel, feel so, it gives you back power because, mm -hmm. yeah, because if I, if I forgive someone and we all get hurt, you know, I, I would presume you know, that most of the people in this place went through breakup. Breakups are very hard because you trust someone and then you think they broke your trust. That's a lot of pain. I went through it, not one time, many times. And I was never wrong. Always the other person was wrong. <laughs> Just telling you guys because, you know, and it's very painful. And you have two choices. You can go through the process of forgiveness, and then you become free. And then you'll be happy for the person to be free. Or you can enslave yourself to, uh, to that bitch. What he's doing? Going to Instagram. Oh my God, she's posing now. You know. And then you become the slave. Or the guy, oh look, he's fucking so cute. <laughs> Why? Just be happy for the person and know that you have to forgive, you have to accept the pain, not deny the pain. He said, I'm painful, there is a lot of pain in me, and I think I've been wronged, but I forgive you because I deserve to forgive. Could you relate to that? No, she cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, of course, we, we hear what he's saying, but, right. but and, and it's beautiful. No, but It is beautiful. And so you can relate, of course. But, of course. <laughs> but, it's beautiful. Um, I do believe that when you carry anger and hate, it's harmful to the person. Right. Um, and so it's better to let it go. That doesn't mean I can, <laughs> always. Um, it doesn't mean I can forgive um, always. Um, I like she's to. She's very forgiving. She's, I know her. She's very forgiving. Well, I forgive you, my dear. <laughs> I didn't do anything to you. <laughs> so please don't forgive me. <laughs> I forgive you for always trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, I can't always do it. I mean, I, I can try, uh, but I can't always do it. I do think, having been a criminal defense lawyer for so long, that when I look at my clients who may 
have done, some of them have done really terrible things. But it's usually the worst five minutes of their life, you know, whatever it was they did. And I've always been able to find a way to relate to those people, find something we can talk about, be with. So, I mean, I'm not the one who has to forgive someone for something that was not done to me. But on the other hand, um, I can, I can hope that uh, we can forgive people in general for doing something that they shouldn't. The people who tortured Muhammadu uh, were basically pretty screwed up people. And I bet if you go back into their family and to their lives that you'll find out that they were abused, mistreated, something terrible happened to them that made them the way they were. Um, you know, Mr. X wasn't always a sick person who um, could torture someone the way he tortured Muhammadu. Richard Zuli, <clears throat> who put people in jail, just as Muhammadu said, in Chicago, and there was a whole group of those Chicago cops. Um, there was a whole group of Chicago cops in Guantanamo? No, a whole group of Chicago cops who were involved in catching the first black person first black young man they could find whenever a white woman was murdered. And pin it on him. Pin it on them in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they got away with it for a yeah. long time. Uh, and there was a whole movie now about them. But um, can I forgive them? Uh, it's hard for me to forgive Richard Zuli. I suppose if I could learn about his history and his background and what happened to him as a child, I might be more forgiving, because I bet there's something. Would you be able to defend the torturers in Guantanamo Bay as a lawyer? Uh, yes. I could defend just about anyone who's charged with a crime, who's charged with a crime um, to make sure that that person has a lawyer to make sure that, you know, I talk about American democracy and the problems and yeah. who has it. Mm -hmm. But still in the, in the US, fortunately, everyone gets a lawyer. And that's something to be proud of, that no one has to stand alone. The, when, when you're charged with a crime, you're facing the power of your own government. You're fighting your own government. And that doesn't usually happen in life. Usually somebody's fighting some other government. You're fighting a, your own government. And the government has so much power. And everyone is entitled to have at least one person stand with them and say, I'm here with this person. If, if you want to lock this person up, then you're going to have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what that person did. And I'm going to tell you who this person is. And if, in fact, the person did this, why it happened. And maybe there's someone else who's responsible. But I, just about anyone. I, you know, the trouble uh, that I couldn't do is someone who um, abused animals. Mm. I don't think I, fortunately, I've never had to. Um, and I don't think I could. Um, you, you're saying, you know, and you have been many times in Chelsea Manning's case and many other cases where you stood next to the person with the whole weight of the state and Muhammad against was, him. Uh, the whole weight of the state, and that's why, partly why I showed as an introduction George Bush and, you know, mm -hmm. that we're getting him. So, aren't you sometimes, well, maybe intimidated, but afraid? the whole weight of the state, you're, you're the one person standing next to it, and then it bears down on you. I never was afraid until, I think, under the Trump administration, when every time I'd leave the country, I'd wonder whether I could get back in, um, whether they were going to come down on lawyers. And there was another period of time. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in, um, I think, 2010. And the title of it was, I'm a terrorist lawyer and proud of it. And um, I wrote that headline in addition 
to the article. And that was because Cheney and Liz Cheney, his daughter, were saying, and there were others saying, these lawyers shouldn't be representing these people in Guantanamo because they're just as bad as their clients if they represent them. And, you know, it made me so angry. It was the anger, actually, that prompted me to write that op-ed piece. And you can still find it. You just put in my name in New York Times. It was originally the International Herald Tribune where it was published. But Nancy Holler, New York Times, just Google it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you'll find the op-ed yeah. piece. It was my best writing, I think. But, you know, the, the whole point of it was um, John Adams, who became the second president of the United States. One of States, the founding fathers. Yeah. Right. He, and one of the few who did not have slaves, he represented the Boston, um, the Brits, who, who in the, what was it called, the um, Boston, the... Tea Party? Tea Party, right. Mm -hmm. And he represented the Brits, the Brits, and everyone hated them. Everyone hated them. And he wrote that it was his finest hour as a lawyer. And there have been other examples of that. Um, the military lawyers who defend people in Guantanamo. It's the finest hour, and yet um, we have to understand what that means. And everyone has to respect that. You just have to respect that. Um, you immediately said yes. The torturers in Guantanamo Bay be defended by Nancy Hollander, who you, I mean, can I say this? Yeah, who you dearly love and yes. respect. <laughs> yes. And um, uh, uh, I heard you say it so I, uh, just before <laughs> we went in, so yes. I, I think I safely can say that. But um, you would say yes, of course. Absolutely. And I agree with something else you said that I'm not defending him. I'm defending the rule of law. Guys, we are cultured people. We understand. We say someone is a torturer. That does not mean this person is guilty of torture. Because there are a lot of circumstances. Maybe the person is crazy. Maybe he was under threat if he didn't do it. And if we let the state do whatever it wants with citizens, then we don't have any democracy anymore. Everybody, everybody, no matter how heinous the crime we think they committed, they deserve to be defended. And they deserve the rule of law. And they, because that's what I'm asking for. I cannot be hypocritical and asking for it, for uh, black people, for Muslim young people, and then said, no, murder, rapist. I'm not the one who decide. It's the judiciary who decide that. And without due process, we cannot convict anyone. In this series uh, of talks we're organizing together, um, on the 13th of December, we'll be talking to Steve Wood actually, who became a friend and was one of your prisoners. Yeah. So, Thank you so um, much. Um, let's leave, I, leave it to that for a moment. Um, maybe there's somebody who has a question. Um, let's see whether I can get to you. There's some back there. Can yeah, there's some people him? in the back. And I'm coming to you because otherwise the people at home won't be able to hear your question. So you have to speak into the microphone. Um, ah, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> Veronica. Uh, hi. Oh, sorry. Um, earlier you said, Nancy, that you believe that no one should ever go to prison. Does that mean that there shouldn't be any prisons at all? And if so, Mohamedou, do you agree? I did say that. I do believe there shouldn't be prisons. That doesn't mean we're going to get rid of them tomorrow. But in my world, we wouldn't have prisons. Mohamedou? Uh, this is a philosophical question, because we are a society. How could we control people who can uh, potentially harm other people with prison, with uh, therapy? With I don't know the answer. So, because this is philosophical, there is no wrong or right answer. There were some hands in the back. I think there was a 
uh, a man with glasses, who's a, t a tall <laughs> man, I suppose. I only see you. I don't see you standing up, but. Uh, first off, thank you very much for the talk. It's quite interesting. Um, I can imagine that if I was in your position, Mohammed, that I would be really angry at life, and maybe as someone that believes, also really angry at God. So I am quite curious how you handle this. I, I, I think you, you maybe underestimate yourself, because have you been in the same situation? OK, then you don't have the answer, because uh, I, can, I don't like to lose. I really like to win. And I would, I would be losing if I live in anger and you know, always like trying to bash the people who did this to me. And I'm now winning because I know in my heart I have no hate toward anyone. And Nancy knows me in person. She knows secret stuff about me that I, me, I may be embarrassed to share with you. And she knows this is who I am. What you see is what you get. So, and uh, I'm happy. And uh, uh, I'm not worried about anyone hating me or anyone who does like my face. They deal with it, not me. Because <laughs> I will go and drink tea, good tea, and watch useless YouTube videos. <laughs> I'm not apologizing even. The lady over here with a headscarf. Yep. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, that you are a very big uh, inspiration for, uh, I think, Thank a lot you. of people here. Thank the, you. Yeah, the noor, the light, is really shining from your face. Thank you so the, much. It's the reflection. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine that the scars, that, the scars that, you've, that you've built over there, they are not seen on your face. So that's a compliment. Um, what I have two questions. Uh, your time in Guantanamo Bay, I was wondering um, to what capacity were you able to keep uh, to your faith? And uh, my second question, I forgot, but the first one first. <laughs> to what capacity were you able, the guards, were you able to practice your faith? First, I, I know this is what Yuri like discussion is about. You know, like, you know, you look different because you have, uh, you cover your hair. And this is so brave because I'm a Muslim and I'm a man and I'm sometimes ashamed because is there anything like to say, oh, I'm a Muslim or something. And anyone who is different, whether in their sexual orientation or their like political belief, and they can like stand out of the masses, those people are brave people because standing out of the masses takes a lot of courage. I'm telling you this. And I think everybody agrees with me because in history, people who say, you know what, this is who I am and I don't need to fit into the masses. I don't need to conform. First, I want to salute you for that, you know. Uh, the other question I forget, but I now I remember. <laughs> so, uh, I really don't know. You know, my grandmother, she taught me, uh, we called her Tutu. She, uh, she is Fatima, but we called her Tutu. And she taught me that if I do good thing, that Allah will give me good thing. If I do bad thing, Allah will give me bad thing. Very simple formula, actually. She told me when I see people on the street and give them money, Allah would give me 10 times the money. And as a child, I was maybe between seven and 10, I did this. And every time I give some money, I get back 10. I think she conspired to get me the money. <laughs> you know, but this was good investment, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so, and, uh, but life is not like that, unfortunately. Because when I was kidnapped, my faith was tested really bad. And who tested it the mo mostly when I was mistreated by Muslims. Because when I was kidnapped, there was no Guantanamo Bay. I was taken to Jordan. Our good Muslim brothers. <coughs> and I was in dungeon, and I could hear a van. And I was telling myself, 
What for do they do adhan or pray? Why? What's that? You know, and I'm saying this, I'm not ashamed to say this, because we really need to find humanity in people. You know, rahma. Rahma. That's our message in our tradition, is that we should show rahma. What is rahma in English? Mercy. Mercy. We should show mercy. Uh, to the to, to humanity, whether they're Muslim or they're from any faith, and this is how I define my faith nowadays, and that helped me a lot to go through this pain. There's a lady with a red sort of um, what is it? Red. <laughs> um, well. Nancy was hoping that I don't pray anymore, but she told me you don't pray as much. <laughs> Did it you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Once he said he was, I don't have to pray. I only have to pray two times a day because I'm on a, I'm traveling. I'm on a trip. She loved it. She was hoping for more. <laughs> <laughs> and one time he did say when I, and if you don't mind my saying No, this, no, say everything. Um, I was there all day and he didn't pray and I said, you didn't pray all day. And he said, well, what, have you suddenly become religious? And I <laughs> said, no, I'm just worried about you. And he said, it's very difficult to keep your faith in here. Of course. <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, thank you both for sharing your story, obviously. But looking at the two of you, you seem like two very different kind of people. But meanwhile, you do have like an amazing friendship, as it seems, or even maybe more than that, like a very true connection to each other. So what do you think is the most important or inspiring thing that you um, learn from each other? You know, I learned from Nancy kindness. She's a very kind person. You know, like you said, you're right. You know, I'm a Muslim. I was born in Mauritania, and I'm a person of color. She was American, and she was born in privilege. She was very educated, and her family was very educated. So, and uh, she did not have to come to my aid, but she did come to my aid, and she made a very, very big sacrifices. And when I was in my community, I always thought only like my community are good people. I did not know that in the other communities there are like good people like Nancy. And this kindness I learned from her. And I want to pay it forward. Can we ask Tell the them same something person? good to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to them, give it to them. <laughs> you know, I, I think I learned patience from Mohamedou. Um, very patient. And, um, you know, at one point he said, if this is what Allah wants for me, I, I can live my life here as long as I'm not tortured. And it, it showed to me a great deal of faith um, and patience and just a willingness to wait it, you know, eventually the good will come. I think um, it's an interesting question indeed. Um, there's a gender difference, there's an age difference. Um, an atheist, I presume of Jewish descent, a religious person um, from Mauritania, different color, different age, different, and indeed, it's a wonderful question. Yes, um, yes, because it shows, uh, like you earlier said, um, humanity. Let's look for humanity and not for Bad age no. difference, gender difference, religious difference, atheist, non -religi religious, non religious. Um, thank you very much. No, there's more questions. I know there's many, many, many more questions. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, we're all already half an hour late. I hope uh, Mohamedou and Nancy Hollander will stay a little bit more and uh, be in the bar and uh, talk to people. Otherwise, do come the 13th of December. Um, uh, we will be here uh, with another um, conversation like we had with Kevin MacDonald and with uh, Larry Seams and now with Nancy Hollander. Thank you very much for traveling the Atlantic 
all the way to have this conversation here. It's really, really wonderful that you are willing to spend all your time with, uh, with us discussing these, these, these important, um, important stories and also important principles we've been discussing. Thank you very, very much for your work and for coming here. And Mohamedou, it's a great, great pleasure again, thank I think you, for the fifth thank time, you. Thank uh, to, you. Thank to uh, talk you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.